Hey yo, from the kingdom of Ohio, you are listening to the O-Culture Podcast. I'm your host, Ryan Peverly. Welcome to the show. Your time and attention is much appreciated. And you picked a curious time to stop by the old self-grappling show because Jason Horsley returns for another conversation after rattling a few cages back in episode 90. But that is exactly why I asked him back. I want to rattle some cages every now and then. I think that's necessary. Jason has a new book out called The Vice of Kings, How Socialism, Occultism, and the Sexual Revolution Engineered a Culture of Abuse. And the title is quite reflective of the content of the book and the content of this conversation. We are going to chat a bit about Jason's family history, which has ties to the Fabian Society and their socialist ideals and the subsequent movement based on them, which may be the driving force behind the idea known as social engineering. We also talk a bit about the role of occultism in all of this. One note though, we had to cut this way shorter than we both probably would have liked because Jason's schedule changed on the day of the interview, so a bit of a shorter show here both on Patreon and the free feed. Although there is a Patreon extension here of about 22 minutes, which is where we talk a bit about the role the sexual revolution played or plays in this culture of abuse. So if you're interested in hearing more, uh, feel free to check out patreon.com slash occulture. Regardless, open ears, open minds, and open hearts required if you choose to venture further. I mean, if you ain't coming correct like that, well, this is not for you. Jason Horsley is back in the house right after this. The time has come to unshackle the beast that you have feared for so long. Relinquish your fear and submit to the cause. You will find all you need in these audio recordings. The year is 1990. Welcome to a culture. Jason Horsley. Hey, welcome back to the show, man. Really appreciate you taking the time to do this again. Oh, thanks, Ryan. I appreciate the invitation. Absolutely, man. So, you know, Jason, I'm going to be honest with you and the audience here. I've read the book cover to cover, you know, every word like I always do, made mm-hmm. notes like I always do, but I have no idea what the hell to talk about or where to start the conversation. So this chat may be all over the place. Regardless, I guess the best place to start is at the beginning with a quote from the book. And then we'll see where this goes. So you said that this book is about the vices of our kings, our cultural heroes and political leaders, not their charms, talents, or occasionally genuine virtues, since these latter are often but cloaks that facilitate the former rather than positive attributes unto themselves. And the same might be said for government and even society in general, as seen in the present work at least. But this latter is only my opinion, and I trust the reader will do his or her part to keep their attention on the facts being presented no matter how challenging they may be to their worldview, and try not to blame the messenger, which would be you and me now, uh, bearing in mind that I am not a historian and this book is not a history book unless it be one of personal history, end quote. And it definitely is a personal history. There's a lot of information about your family in here and some connections they had or have, both socially and politically. And I feel like it's necessary and relevant to flesh out some of those connections up front here. And there's a lot that we could talk about just on this subject. 
But first, tell us about your brother and what happened with him, because it really is the foundation of the book. Yeah, yeah, you're right about that. It was the inspiration for the book, and it actually began, uh, or the process, the writing process that, that became Vice of Kings actually began while I was trying to finish a previous book, Seen and Not Seen, which came out in 2014. And uh, as I was trying to finish that book, I, I ended up focusing on my brother and his his untimely death in 2010 of a heroin overdose. Uh, he was he was a, a dandy. He was a painter, but he, he admitted that painting or artistic creation was, was secondary or even tertiary to his self-creation uh, and his lifestyle. And he was a, he was a, a avowed nihilist. He described himself as a futile blaze of color and gray, futile world. I forget. I'm paraphrasing there. And he he dedicated his life uh, later on anyway to indulging his pleasures and his senses and uh, pursuing extremes of experience and performing for the public, if you could, as it, as this persona that he created, the dandy in the underworld, as he called it in his memoir. And and so he and he wrote this memoir about three years before he died. I think it came out in two thousand and seven. That was, of course, included myself and my family in it. I didn't read it to begin with. I think I only read it a few months before he died, and because I I knew what to expect. Uh, my brother created a myth around himself, a sort of cloak and a a fantasy. I call it, uh, or I refer to glamour. Glamour magic, the folklore about ugly fairies who are able to create glamour to make themselves seem like princes and princesses. That's the opening. The intro of the book, as you know, is glamour vice. This correspondence between glamour and vice is also the the well-known parable of the, the picture of Dorian Gray written by Oscar Wilde, who was also a dandy, although my brother rejected him as a dandy. But anyway, which is about the... Uh, the, the very dissolute, decadent individual, Dorian Gray, who, who makes a deal with the devil. I forget the exact specifics of it, but he's able to commit any number of vices, and none of it shows, uh, but he has this painting that was done of him that is the spell that is cast, and the, the painting, the image of him becomes progressively uglier, and that's how... Uh, he is able to be aware of the corruption of his soul through this this painting, but it doesn't show on his actual physical form, so no one else knows about it. So that's uh, that's the glamour uh, that that conceals the vice, if you will. And anyway, long story short, when he died and the way that he died, it was clear to me that uh, there was a lot that wasn't apparent about his life and what he'd been doing and, and how it had led to his self-destruction. So I began trying to understand that by looking at everything I knew about him and everything I could find out about him. And that that made it very hard to finish seen and not seen because the book became incredibly much more profound and, 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 and heavy, if you like, much more dense and much more, there was much more at stake. It had started out as a, a book about movies and it ended up being a book about my family and, and my childhood and trauma. And um, so, but I was able to finish the book, but at the same time, I, I, I had only just begun the investigation that became Vice of Kings. And uh, I mean, Seen and Not Seen just sums up really many of the discoveries I made around my family. That is kind of like a zip file that I then try to unpack for the first part of Ice Kings, which is Occult Yorkshire, and most of it centers around my grandfather, Alec Horsley, the father of my father, who was Nicholas Horsley, who ran the, the multinational corporation Northern Foods that was started by my grandfather as Northern Dairies. as a very small local business. And uh, my grandfather's many affiliations, which fortunately I had a very, very small bio that he had written as an introduction to this book of poems by by a convicted rapist in which he, my grandfather just summed up his life but because of the way my grandfather was he, he he singled out the most historically significant things but also the famous people he, he, that he had known some of them were famous not in 
in the household name way, but in terms of politics and business and so on. And so I, that gave me an awful lot of leads to follow up. And um, so that kept me busy for several years, really, just following all of these leads and and, and each one leading to more leads. The main, the main one, as you know, was, was my grandfather's participation in the Fabian Society as an early founder, not at the beginning of the Fabian Society, because that was the late 1800s. My grandfather was um, born in 1902, but in his, his local area in Hull, in Yorkshire, he was a founding member. So he certainly was still one of the early pioneers of spreading Fabianism, which created the Labour Party in England, which is the left wing part of the, the uh, party political system there. And my grandfather and my father was always uh, involved in left-wing politics, in Labour politics. So, uh, so clearly that was a very significant lead, and it, and hence the the first part of the book is dedicated to understanding better the Fabian Society, and as you know, that that opened all these other roads into areas that I was much more familiar with or, already, such as uh, MK Ultra and espionage in general, and and occultism. So you did say in the book that your father and your grandfather did not really seem to get along well. Is that right? Yeah, I um, I didn't ever see that, or rather I don't ever remember seeing it. I'm sure I must have seen it and been around it. My father uh, left us when I was about seven, so I wouldn't have been visiting my grandfather with him later in life. I still visit my grandfather and I still visit my father. But I wouldn't have seen them together very often, I don't think, later on. But I would have seen it growing up. But I wasn't really aware of it until much later in life. My mother talked to me about my grandfather and how he was a bully and how my father hated him. And later, I, even in, my, in the last couple of years of my father's life, I, I talked to him, I even interviewed him and filmed it. Not for any reason similar. You know, I had no idea back then. I just wanted to get, I was making films and, and talking to people, so I, I wanted to talk to him in that capacity, but it did come up how he had always hated his father. I think he even put it in those terms, but he didn't say why, and and he never did say why, at least not to me or anyone that I know. Uh, and all I had as a as a clue from my mother was that he was a bully, and I think my father did confirm that much. That he put a lot of pressure on on his children. My father was his firstborn son to to achieve in life and um, drove them into overachieving, if you will. And, and, and I think my father was, he, he was certainly acknowledging that. But what I began to uncover through my investigations was that there must also have been um, an element of betrayal, the feeling of betrayal that my father, I think, must have had when, as he began to discover the true nature of my, of his father's, involvement with politics and ideology and whatnot because uh, from what I've uncovered my, my grandfather wasn't really a socialist uh, he advocated socialism and he and he seemed to be um, supporting those endeavors but he was also involved in you know with more aristocratic or ruling elite the, the, the pursuits of the ruling class I think that that that, that created a schism in my father's psyche that he was, and it's ironically or, or fittingly, it's the symbol of the Fabian society as a wolf in sheep's clothing. So I, so I suspect, and I, obviously I have to speculate a lot, and it's, it's risky, but that my father did discover that his father was a wolf in sheep's clothing and that he'd been installed with an ideology that itself was a kind of delivery device for, you know, or a disguised form of, of a very different ideology that actually went against my father's principles, but at the same time he was, it's, it's complex now, it's like a Trojan horse, he, he had been actually raised with, with his father's principles, but without fully understanding what they were, so I think he inherited a kind of false personality or a false self that he then was crippled by, and he was literally crippled, in fact. Well, I want to dig into the Fabian Society and Fabianism and what their ideals are, but first, I, I want to ask you a question based on something that your father, I guess, told you at some point during your life. It revolves around the terms conspiracy and cock-up. Uh, mm. You use those terms in this book when referring to how we could view history. You said that your father actually used is the one that used to refer to that. So 
What's the difference mm. between the conspiracy theory of history and the cock-up theory of history? Well, uh, I think, as my father described it, it was quite glib and quite simple. And he was just saying, you know, that some people believe that history is all a conspiracy and it's all worked out and mapped. And, and other people believe it's just random, random, really, and that, you know, human beings uh, just try to attempt things and they mess it up and then the results spill out the way they spill out. So in that sense, it's it's really a very simple sort of dichotomy. I is is it ordered and directed, or is it just random and kind of chance? But I think there's a deeper polarity there, which I I touch on in that introduction, uh, partly inspired by conversations with Theodore Dalrymple or, or reading some of his work, which is that there's a lot of what can be seen if if analyzed quite closely as deliberately intentional programs of social engineering seem to disguise themselves as cock-ups as in there are there are policies that are implemented and this is seen particularly in the uk or i was particularly aware of it in the uk but i think it's probably universal but that that have a designated or a spoken aim that is the opposite of the one that's achieved. And and so it looks as though it's just kind of naively devised and then and then fumbled and then just badly bungled in the impl- implementation, such as something like the welfare system that is supposed to give people more autonomy and more self-respect and so on by supporting them, but ends up with a kind of opposite thing where people are just so dependent on the state that they they just lose all sense of responsibility and and become you know kind of enslaved to the state that's supposedly giving them freedom. That would be a very broad example of something that could be seen as just a poorly devised strategy or and a poorly implemented one, or one that was actually worked out in advance via a knowledge of uh, individual and and group psychology. And, and my view is, is the latter, and that's what I look at in the book with the evidence of Fabian society. That they, they, they studied crowds and individuals, and they developed, they did a lot of research, a lot of, you know, data collecting and comparative and the mass observation I write about. They did massive surveys, not just the Fabian society, and they used that information to come up with policies that could act as as, as wolves in sheep's clothing that would appear to be trying to implement a certain kind of social change with the knowledge that they would have the opposite effect. Yeah, we've talked a bit about crowd psychology on this show, not so much about the Fabian Society and their, I guess, version of socialism, which I'd like to dig into now. So give us a a nice overview, if you could, of what the Fabian Society is historically and how they and what their ideals are and how we can identify them, I guess, in the culture that we've been all raised in. Yeah, I keep getting that question, Ryan, and I suppose if I keep answering it, <laughs> I'll get better at answering it, but it's not, I have to say, it's not what I enjoy answering. It's just because it's so, I mean, you've read the book. There's such a, a large picture to try and draw to even give a sense of this. So the simple version never really does it, but I'll try anyway. The simple historical version is that the Fabian Society was started as the Fellowship of New Life in, uh, I think, 1883, roughly. Uh, it was the year Marx died, I know that. And Marx was in London at the time. Whether he was involved, I haven't been able to ascertain, but certainly some of the the players that, uh, that created the Fabian Society did know Marx, and they certainly knew of Marx and of his work. And, and uh, George Bernard Shaw, who's the, one of the leading creators of the Fabian Society, was interested in introducing Marx to a wider audience. So there is a Marxist element to it there. There's also a spiritualist element, because Frank Podmore, as far as I know, came up with the name the Fabian Society. He was a spiritualist. So there's that aspect there at the very inception, that of occultism. And thirdly, Havelock Ellis, who's, who was the, the, the Alfred Kinsey of his day. He was, he was the person who coined the term homosexual and other, other very key terms. And he also wrote you know, massive tomes on sexual behavior and like Kinsey also was very interested in sexual perversion and considered it an expression of of the freedom of the the human soul as it were that the more perverse we could become as human beings the more free we would be so that's 
Crowley's you know, left-hand path, transgression, the path of transgression, was also there at the inception of Fabianism, uh, although, of course, it's concealed. Anyway, so these, there, and then there was George, not George, Sidney and Beatrice Webb, were also quite well-known, founding Fabians. A, a little bit later, there was Virginia Woolf and uh, her husband, I've kind of forgotten his name, but anyway, the Woolfs, and H.G. Wells was a Fabian for a period, or I think he may have got disillusioned, but anyway, whether or not he did, he's a good example, I think, of the way that the Fabian society proceeded, because they, they, they were politically involved, they created the Labour Party, as I said, they were involved in scientific research, they were involved in creating economics as we know it, um, John Maynard Keynes, the famous economist who really created the economy, the economic systems, or at least philosophies or principles that we, our economy revolves around, he was a Fabian. But also, I think even primarily the arts was where the Fabians were, oh, an education actually, where maybe that would be primary even over the arts. But the arts would be the way that we would be most familiar with their influence. Uh, I mean, also education, of course, because they managed to infiltrate the education system not just in England, but also abroad. Um, John Taylor Gatter wrote a book about this, The the Underground History of American Education. And he has a whole chapter for the Fabian Society, which I quote uh, you know, extensively through the book because of the, the rigorous research he did there. And uh, they referred to themselves as permeators. So their, their idea was to permeate society via subtle long-term influence, which is where the the term Fabian also comes from the the Roman general Fabius, who had unusual military tactics, which was to starve out the enemy, for example, or to to invade very incrementally rather than you know all at once and so on. And there's the idea of the tortoise really that wins the race by just plodding along rather than rushing. And uh, the permeation is 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 also that like. They they went about having a, a a big, a widespread public influence, but rather by subtly and over over time influencing those who would have influence in society. Now, of course, some of them did have direct influence. Someone like George Bernard Shaw had a huge amount of influence, but it was in the in the arts. Uh, same with H. G. Wells, although he's more well, I suppose they're both recognised as political creative figures. But they're not necessarily recognized as Fabians. You know, they're, they're recognized as political writers. But anyway, I say one would have to look at all the many examples to really understand how widespread the influence is, which is what I do in the book. And as you know, I end up with many different areas that, that aren't directly related to Fabianism, but can be traced back to it either through individuals or through groups or through agendas, or through, you know, most subtly of all, through through principles, beliefs, and uh, philosophies. Yeah, and I do just want to mention a couple of those areas real quick. You know, you mentioned economics. The Fabians founded the London School of Economics. Many notable names uh, have passed through there, including Lord Rothschild, David Rockefeller, John F. Kennedy, uh, John Maynard Keynes, the economist whose name you just mentioned, and I guess who's been called the spiritual heir to Count Cagliostro, which I have not heard before, but you mentioned that in the book. His name's popped up on the show here before. Some other Fabian names more directly related to what maybe the audience is interested in, uh, Zechariah Sitchin, Whitley Strieber, who we talked about last time, but also Mick Jagger, frontman of the Rolling Stones. And why I find Jagger so fascinating, Jason, is because that band was the headliner of the infamous Ultimate Concert in California, which a lot of folks point to as the end of the, the protest era of the 60s. A lot of theories about how that may have been engineered, that concert, to paint the anti-war movement as radical or dangerous. And I'm off on a brief tangent here about that. But as we're talking through this, it's important to keep some names in mind and keep their lives and their work in mind to maybe re-examine if we feel the need to. There's also Fabian connections to the World Bank and the International Monetary Fund. Uh, Keynes was involved in some interesting business there with some of the leadership of those banks, lots of money moving around. I think you, you said something about like $4 billion in transactions that kind of sketchy. Uh, we don't need to go into that unless you think it's necessary. Mm, but, well, that was decades ago. I mean, that was sure. back in the 30s or something. So yeah, that was a vast amount of money yeah, that went into spreading the Fabian influence. Absolutely. And then also in the book, and I think this might be the area that we could look at in our own lives where we've all had direct interaction with this, 
you were talking about your frustrations with school, and you said that the methods of teaching in American schools, and schools in the UK too probably, directly relate to Fabian methods of social engineering and were very much meant to be soul-deadening and mind-crushing. And mm. uh, no, no disagreement here, but you know, do tell us a bit about those methods as far as you know about them. I'm sure some folks in the audience may recognize the, uh, the template, so to speak. Right. Well, I went to a, a private school, which is called a public school in, in England, all, all boys. So I had a, a very direct and visceral experience of just how oppressive that system was. It, it was similar to the school in, if you ever saw the Malcolm McDowell movie, If, from 1968, it's similar to that. Uh, prefects, uniforms, uh, caning, you know, as in corporal punishment, uh, uh, army training, uh, sports, obviously. And um, I absolutely hated every minute of it. And I mean, I was lucky comparatively because I, I had a mother and parents who were sympathetic because they were non-conventional, even though they sent me to that school. So I wasn't completely, you know, I was aware that there was something wrong with that system. I didn't I didn't just put it down to myself like there must be something wrong with me if I can't fit into it. I really knew that this was a bad system and I just had to get through it. And I managed, you know, I did all kinds of subtle rebellions in order not to get crushed out of shape or distorted too much by that system. But I didn't I still didn't understand to the extent that I've come to understand later that that much of that oppressive regulation, even from you know, from the template on, so this, it doesn't have to be a particularly, you know, oppressive or conformist school system to simply have the template of bells ringing and 40-minute classes, you know, compartmentalized knowledge and moving from one classroom to the next. If we think of it, if we sort of step back from that a little bit, it's very easy to see how that's like like rats in a maze in a laboratory, you know, being trained and being conditioned by reward and punishment and how that will have the effect of actually reconfiguring consciousness of, of the participants of the rats in question just as well was shown by somebody like Pavlov you know the dogs that salivate when the bell rings because they learn to associate the two things together the food with the ringing bell well, in the education system I mean, this is what I've discovered, and I didn't look into it at great depth because it wasn't wasn't central to Vice of Kings, but that the schooling system as we know it seems to have been derived from the Prussian system of, of military, of, of training people for the military, which was about really conditioning soldiers in such a way that they, they would not rebel, they would be absolutely, utterly obedient, because, of course, to have a general or even a prince surrounded by a thousand soldiers uh, and feel absolutely safe that they wouldn't just turn on him. They had to figure out ways to you know, absolutely crush any kind of in independent, autonomous, um, potentially rebellious spirit. And so apparently they came up with these systems that were then adapted into the education system, I suppose in Prussia too, and, and then imported to the West or the, the larger you know, West and have become the educational norm. I mean, I know that they are changing now in, in certain ways, but anyway, so, um, yeah, so, so that was very much my experience anyway. With retrospect, I, with hindsight or the knowledge I have now, I can look back at that time and see, oh, yes, that's exactly what was going on. I would go to school every day, I'd have to put on the uniform. I mean, even just getting up was, was hellish just knowing what I was going to have to do. Then I would put on the uniform, hating it, hating what it meant. And then I would get on the bus and go to school. And I, and then I would be there, you know, and then I'd be going from one box to another, figuratively and literally, as the bell rang, and then being forced to take on this knowledge that meant nothing to me, that had, you know, no interest. I wasn't given any reason to, to want to be, to know it, to learn it, you know, to, it wasn't made interesting. So I was constantly having to kind of suppress, well, not kind of, suppress my spirit uh, just to be there, you know, on an hour-by-hour, day-by-day basis. And I think that, that that's very intentional and deliberate, I think. Yeah, it would seem so. And uh, I want to read something that you wrote, too, here around this same topic. You said, but then, if John Taylor Gatto is right, education itself was a Fabian agenda. And in those days, people had a very different idea of abuse. 
Add to that the possibility that sexual interference with children may be an unacknowledged intrinsic part of British schooling, particularly for the upper classes. And then while the gun may not be smoking, there's definitely an echo of a shot. So parse that out for us real quick, particularly that notion that sexual interference with children may be this intrinsic part of British schooling. Did you have any direct experience with that? Not not at school as far as I know. I, I do. Well, I have started to wonder because I've had to start to question everything about my past and my memories. But I definitely don't have any memory of being sexually interfered with at school. Uh, but then I only went to boarding school for two terms. As I write there, I, before I went to Pocklington, the, the, the public school I described, it was all boys' school. And I wasn't boarding there. That was part. That was why I went because it was a local school. Before that, I spent two terms at Abbott's Home, which was a school created by Cecil Reddy, who, who was a Fabian or at least was closely affiliated with Fabian groups, including uh, Wicca, you know, early Wiccan groups, and their symbol was even the, the is even the pentangle, the five-pointed star, and none of which I knew at the time. And that school was a, a very progressive liberal school. That's the whole point. And I don't know what went on there. I mean, it was a mixed school. I know that my brother lost his virginity there uh, at 12, but apparently in in an ordinary way with a girlfriend. I have no particular reason to think there was sexual abuse going on there, but then I have no reason to think that there isn't or that there wasn't. But the main main template I'm referring to there is that the boys being buggered, to put it bluntly, at all boys boarding school is is just a known fact of british history like it's it was just known that it happened or it's become known anyway that it happened at all of those all boys boarding schools it was just a part of the growing up rituals and of course it's just seen as one of those things like the you know the child abuse within the catholic church it's just one of those things it's not seen as you know, deliberate or intentional or endemic to the institutional policies or anything. It's seen as a, as a corruption of them or an abuse of them. And, and of course, that may be so. But I suspect that, at least in the case of the school system, although perhaps even with the Catholic Church as well, it's a deliberately implemented thing. And uh, I mean, of course, it, it it's not either or, because if you have boys being sexually interfered with or even raped by school teachers they will then grow up and and when they become prefects or at least you know the older boys at the school they're likely to do the same to the younger boys without being consciously inducted into any kind of occult philosophy you know about trauma genesis so then it happens organically and the same could be true of many of the teachers doing it they may not consciously know they may not be consciously acting out any kind of policy. They may just be indulging their own sexual pathologies. But um, again, it's it's not either or, it's a spectrum. And there's certainly, it's certainly fairly well known in Britain and elsewhere that if you want to toughen up a child, even sending children to boarding school has been seen that way. Or they need to be toughened up. They need to be separated from their parents. And, um, you know, to learn to become independent and to function in the world and to achieve, you know, high so- social status, that's part of the rite of passage, that's central to it. And, and, it, and it extends beyond that. Obviously, corporal punishment is also meant to toughen up the boys. So I think that, I think that that's the tip of an iceberg when it comes to the aristocracy specifically, that if if they i mean in order to i say prepare it's not really the word but to shape the child and of course it's a jesuit thing give me the child and i'll give you the man to shape the child's psyche and personality in such a way that they will be useful and productive and effective as leaders of society then deliberate abuse is part of that toughening up process but i'm putting toughening up in quotes a because it doesn't toughen them up it just makes them very hard edged and also potentially brittle but b because it's it's much more than just toughening it's actually creating a a specific kind of pathology i believe that includes 
uh, ruthlessness, determination, extreme ambition, you know, you name it, the, the basic sociopathic personality type that is unable to love and connect to other human beings and because of that is, is ferociously driven to achieve social status and doesn't have any qualms or conscience about how they do so. Like it, it's easy to see how an aristocracy that wants to maintain its uh, you know, supremacy, how a ruling class that wants to continue to rule would come up with ways to uh, condition its, its, its progeny with the qualities necessary to maintain that, that rule. Yeah, and another quote that you shared from John Taylor Gatto in the book does talk about this, the role that stress plays in Fabian evolutionary theory. I just want to share this real quick. John said that just as Hegel taught that history moves faster toward its conclusion by way of warfare, so evolutionary socialists were taught by Hegel to see struggle as the precipitant of evolutionary improvement for the species, a necessary purifier eliminating the weak from the breeding sweepstakes. Society evolves slowly towards social efficiency all by itself, but society under stress evolves much faster. Thus, the deliberate creation of crisis is an important tool of evolutionary socialists. Does that... So... Mm, yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, well, thanks for that, because that, <laughs> that really strips it down. I could have saved a lot of words, couldn't I? Because it's Darwinian, essentially. I mean, if you think of the, the Darwinian belief, and I think Darwinianism, to some extent, is a self-fulfilling philosophy. I don't think... I think it's one that's been weaponized. But in, in any event, you know, people and groups who believe in that who believe in the survival of the fittest, it's quite easy to see how that could be mapped onto all of the things that we're talking about here. You simply, you know, you, you create an artificial selection system where you, you're constantly traumatizing uh, generations to, to see who survives and the survivors will, you know, be the ones who get inducted and recruited into the ruling uh, policies and, and programs. Yeah, and Jason, we got about 20 minutes left. And before we go, I wanted to touch on occultism i'm curious like first of all was your family into the occult were they intellectually curious about it were they practicing it were they running in circles with people who did no well uh, except the last bit i don't know um i mean apparently they were but that came as a surprise to me because i mean my father was an atheist and would have absolutely scorned all that stuff even my brother scorned even though his lifestyle seemed like an occultist in the way he dressed and some of his philosophy but he he openly scorned occultism and anything woo including conspiracies and he certainly disliked Alistair Crowley but I think that was because my brother was involved in the occult uh, early in life and perhaps later too but uh, my father I'd be very surprised although he might have been a Freemason or that, I don't know but I'd be really surprised by that my grandfather, I, I, I do suspect now that he almost said he must have been. I think he was, I think he was lightly involved in early psychedelic use because he was, he was so into, you know, progressive exploration. And, um, that would obviously have included sexual exploration, but I suspect it would have included psychedelic considering his friends, you know, mescal in those early days, Aldous Huxley and whatnot. And uh, it's it's just a hop, skip, and a jump from there to occultism. So there isn't any direct evidence, but certainly I I took to occultism like a fish to water. So that and that must have to do with my psychological makeup. So somewhere I got the imprint that made me very sympathetic or compatible with with Crowleyanity to the point that you know, like Cinderella, the shoe fit to my lifetime's regret really because i you know i embraced the occult ideology for for a couple of decades and i feel i was lucky to have survived it yeah you said in the book that it took you years to even begin to see the unconscious psychological complexes fueling and shaping your conscious interest in and pursuit of occultism i'm curious if you've i don't know i guess if you've sort of solved that riddle can you talk more about those unconscious psychological complexes well, um, again, you know, back to early trauma, and if we, you know, boil it down real simple, and then maybe we can expand it out to more nuanced picture. But to me, the occultism, I'd say it's the hidden ideology of the West. Number one, I think we're seeing that with something like the transgender movement. I think it's an inherently occultist philosophy that's behind identity politics, and the 
what's central to occultism is the will to power. So we could see that the will to power dressed itself up in, you know, very friendly clothing, say, uh, as, as the pursuit of happiness, like a very normalized, a very benign uh, kind of neutral ideological prescriptive that runs Western society, you could say, is the pursuit of happiness, which we're now seeing in the transgender movement as, and not just, but as sort of most boldly in the transgender movement, as you can be whoever you pretend to think that you really are kind of thing, which my interesting was my brother's credo, that you, I am who I pretend to be. And the idea behind my brother's thing is similar to transgender is, is that there's no true self. He, he felt he didn't even exist as a child, really, because he hadn't developed a personality. And therefore, the only true self is the one that he could cobble together out of cultural influences and preferences and likes and all the rest of it, which also, incidentally, is the transhuman idea of the beeman, which is basically the assemblage of all our preferences, likes, uh, you know, beliefs and memories and so on, and that's it. Uh, and that can be a, a, a digitalized version of that because it's just data-based. Now, I trace that back to the false identity self that's created as a reaction against trauma and as a means to deal with trauma, and that thereby sort of gets installed in the body as a, a kind of toxic lattice work of, of trauma affect. Like when the body is traumatized, the trauma goes into the body, it gets trapped in the body, and the libido life force can't get freely distributed around the body, and it gets, or at least a portion of it, gets hijacked and compartmentalized into this false identity self, which is the the guardian of the whole system that will keep the trauma out of awareness by whatever means necessary. And those means will also be the way in which that compartmentalized self continues to aggrandize itself and to achieve more and more power. So that's the will to power and that gets implanted in us through trauma and that creates all of the philosophies and the ideologies and the principles and the values of our society, which, as I say, can be summed up in a very vanilla way as the pursuit of happiness. But if we if we dig under the surface of this socially endorsed, you know, universal value, I think we'll find the roots of occultism, which is the Luciferian bid to, to reign in hell, to achieve absolute power over everything in one's environment, including one's body, to have power over one's body, which means not letting one's soul in, as it were, not letting the fullness of one's consciousness or awareness and or the divine in into the body, into, into incarnation. So um, I know I've just given you a big mouthful, haven't I? But you're asking about, yeah, what drove me to occultism? So, so yeah, what's, the experiences that occurred to me in childhood that traumatized me, which I don't remember except somewhat as body memory, which you, which I write about in Vice of Kings, sort of created the foundation, or, or better, a better metaphor would be the, the crystal the matrix around which um, a false identity was able to form over, you know, during my formative years by drawing upon the socio-cultural influences that surrounded me. Now, in Seen Not Seen, that's what that's all about. I got those consciously from children's books, Winnie the Pooh, uh, Marvel comics, pop music like David Bowie, who was, who was into Alistair Crowley and, and Nazism, occultism, and uh, movies, Clint Eastwood being the primary one. Um, and then later I was drawn to occultism. But occultism was a continuation of those interests that began with Winnie the Pooh, the most benign, and then very quickly became, I'd say, I'd say, you know, observably not so benign, observably about the will to power with the Marvel superheroes, and then much more overtly occult with David Bowie, and much more overtly violent and destructive with Clint Eastwood, and then Alistair Crowley and Carlos Castaneda, the adult versions. Right? Those actually became, you know, adult pursuits. That seemed like a reasonable pursuit, but not to my father or my brother. I think this is part of it. it was, partly a rebellion against, you know, my my direct familial influences, which were quite materialistic, that somehow paved the way or created a template where I was naturally drawn by rebellion to, to 
try and create slash discover my own identity through the pursuit of the occult because you know not everybody who's traumatized who seeks power who's driven by the will to power ends up in occultism it's got to be a perfect storm of all these other factors but i would say that i i probably for whatever reason and I think it does have to do with how deep my family was embedded in this, what I write about in Vice of Kings. I was driven to try and get to the very heart of our culture, which is, I don't know, I'm a bit leery or wary of using a term for it. I was going to say Luciferian, I was going to say Satanic, but let's say that it's probably most accurately described in in the occult ideologies and narratives and specifically Crowley. I think I think there's a reason why Crowley had such a massive influence and it's not simply that he had an influence so he shaped society. It's rather that he was a vessel like somebody like Hitler for the collective psyche and he actually embodied and expressed a pathology that's very profoundly embedded in our society and brought it all the way into the mainstream as what we know of as you know, Western occultism, which includes Wicca, as you know, if you've read the read the book. Yeah, and you know, I also, I mean, I identify with where you're coming from. I got into these topics maybe four to five years ago through art, music, books, and conspiracy culture, and I largely explained this to myself as as research for fiction writing, which I have an interest in. But the more I got into it, the more I realized the research I was doing into it wasn't compelled at all by a desire to incorporate the ideas into fiction, mostly because I wasn't writing any fiction. So I, I have to I have to question myself, like, why did I get into this? Why was this appealing to me? Because there are some nooks and crannies of it that really turned me off to it. And uh, we're talking about some of them now and, you know, sort of the role that occultism historically has played in this ritual abuse and creating what we would call, I guess, a, a culture of abuse. And, you know, you actually wrote that apparently one primary reason most people dismissed the subject of organized ritual abuse is because of the connection with occultism, uh, specifically with Satanism, which you just referred to as well. And I'm curious if you think if this is just a case of people not wanting to dwell on what could be a social reality because they just want to continue to enjoy what they believe in and what they do in their lives. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, yeah, that's a primary motivation for everything, of course. But at the same time, then that raises the question of you know, why they believe what they believe and that are they have they been conditioned or tricked to believe things they believe because that will make them uh, complicit with the very things that they don't want to see, you know, that, that are going on. And I think that's, that's very much the case. Again, you think of me and movies. I mean, how much do movies make us complicit with the culture that creates them and thereby the what I call the superculture that our visible culture is embedded in, which is a, a culture of organized crime and something far beyond what we imagine is even possible in terms of organized crime. I mean, in terms of, for example, satanic ritual abuse uh, or human manipulated alien abductions and think and psychic attack and electronic attack and all of the wildest conspiracy theories and not just theories, but, you know, experiences that uh, people who are half mad or schizophrenic or, you know, just so badly traumatized that nobody even or well, very few people take them seriously. The, the, there does seem to be, as, as I write, the, or as I quote at the introduction of Vice of Kings, that there is a hidden aspect to our world that was recognized in, you know, more simple, I don't know if we'd say that society or a more superstitious time. Of course, that word superstitious isn't accurate either, but more religious oriented times anyway was, was identified as, um, you know, powers and principalities of darkness, that there were demons in this world and that they acted upon us and that this realm was even Satan's realm and, and so on. And so we had to, you know, be, be on guard at all times. Well, of course, we've mostly lost that mindset, like our, our mindset, our paradigm has been reconfigured over the last couple of centuries. So we now attempt to explain or describe phenomena in a much more literal reductionist way. And so we end up with narratives that seem to be inherently contradictory a lot of the time, or at least they just are unbelievable anyway. And uh, it, yeah, it's a terrible, um, terribly difficult thing to get to grips with, as, as you probably know yourself, like what's going on behind the, behind the scene and, and 
how are we complicit with it? And I think we do have to start with, I mean, one of, one of my ways that I approach this is, and I'm doing this currently with a series on Hollywood, is I juxtapose the two things. I juxtapose, okay, so my experience of movies was basically benign. I, I loved them. They were, they, they were art. A lot of them were brilliantly done. They just, you know, and the actors and the directors of people that I admired and thought that I would want to get to know and be part of that community. It seemed like a dream world, like a, like the best part of the culture somehow was represented there. And then, but then over the years, I began to learn more and more about, you know, what was going on in society around organized ritual abuse, let's say, or mind control. And, and so I juxtapose those two things because they seem inherently contradictory. It's like they, com- they can't both be true. Like Clint Eastwood couldn't possibly be, you know, going to Bohemian Grove and, and you know, sacrificing children and at the same time be making movies that I loved and grew up on as a child, right? That, that, there's so much cognitive distance there that, that that's a rich vein to try and tap and see if it's possible to, to discover enough connective tissue between those two apparently opposed perspectives that they, they become unified. And I think that it is possible, and I think, but I think it's an incredibly difficult enterprise, and that very, very few people want to embark on that. They will, they'll either stay with the uh, initial interpretation that culture is what it seems, and and it's basically a wonderful thing, even though there are some bad apples, or they will flip, and they'll end up in this subculture, the second matrix, you know, built by David Icke and. and uh, Alex Jones and the, these types and Whitley Strieber, and they'll see that everything's this big dark satanic conspiracy. But they, but somehow they don't connect. They'll still carry on watching Netflix and movies as if it was benign, or they'll tell themselves they're just looking for clues, or somehow they'll practice a kind of double think. And I shouldn't say they, because I'm I'm doing it too, but I'm constantly trying to, I'm constantly reminding myself that I'm doing it, and then trying to as I say, bridge those worlds to fuse them together so that I can see the culture I'm embedded in more and more as an extension of this superculture that's invisible to us because we've been blinded to it. It's the matrix that, you know, the, the, the world that was pulled over our eyes to, to blind us. It's, it's that, really, isn't it? Ironically, that was a movie again. So there you go as another example. Like, we even our tools that we get to try and get to the truth are given to us by the thing that, that's trapping us. So they they don't work either. It's it's quite maddening. The only thing that seems to work is to is to go back to the trauma and back into the body and refer to the body where the trauma is. That's why I ended the book on affect on this idea of affect, which is body memory, but also body experience. Like where are we and what are we and who are we at a bodily level. I think is the only way we can ever get get out of this trap. I don't think we can think or, or research our way out. Yeah, I would agree with that, man. And as we wrap up here, you know, we had a little less time than we had originally scheduled because your schedule changed, and that's totally cool. But we did leave a lot on the table here because there's so much that we could talk about, and maybe we could have a, a sequel at some point down the line. But for anyone who's interested in picking up the book, Vice of Kings, or keeping up with your work online, where can they find it? Autoculture is my website at auticulture.com. That links to my podcast, The Liminalist, and the books uh, are all listed there, and the blog and all the rest of it. Yeah, they can find everything there. And um, as far as following it up, I'd be happy to. I also feel that we're a bit rushed. We didn't even get to Alistair Crowley, uh, which is through the last interview I did about the book. Uh, we didn't get to Crowley either, and he so we had to book a, a follow up. So depending on what you like and also if the kind of feedback you get. If you want to do a follow-up, I'd be happy to, to get to that because I think it's obviously it's the central part of the book. Absolutely, yeah. I'll have your people get with my people and see what we can uh, do about <laughs> that. So, <laughs> Jason Horsley, thanks a lot for your time, man. Really appreciate it. Take care of yourself, and I'll talk to you soon. Okay, thanks, Ryan. And there you have it. My thanks again to Jason Horsley, and my apologies for just scratching the surface with this material. Although, what was here (laughs) might just be enough. Jason's book is dense, and there is a fuck ton of detail in there about his familial connections in both the corporate and political arenas that would honestly take many hours to present in podcast format, and that's still leaving a lot on the table in terms of 
conversational material because the second part of the book, as he alluded to there at the end, deals more with occultism and Aleister Crowley and how sex magic and other associated beliefs and ideals and rites and rituals played a key role in helping engineer this culture of abuse, as Jason calls it in the book. I will say that reading The Vice of Kings made me uncomfortable at times, and that feeling was similar to the one I got while reading Jason's previous book, Prisoner of Infinity. Something about this work just gets under my skin and hits a lot closer to home than I would like. Obviously, these are uh, dreary and depressing topics to broach in a conversation on a podcast where, you know, I typically try to keep things as upbeat and as positive as possible, but sometimes you do have to challenge yourself and venture outside that comfort zone. And not just venture out there, but do so without blinding yourself to what it is that's objectively transpiring around you. Now, Jason did say that people who share these occult belief systems and engage in these practices may be complicit in the engineering of this culture of abuse. Or maybe that was my inference of what he said. Regardless, that seems a bit naive to me, maybe too much of a witch hunt, I don't know, but only because no matter what you believe in or practice, no matter what you do in your public or professional or personal life, I think we're all sort of complicit in the culture we've allowed to be built for us. You know, I'm very much in that old school uh, FUBU mentality, if you remember that clothing line, for us, by us. That has some racial undertones to it, but still, I'm into the idea that creating anything, be it our culture, our greater shared physical reality, your mundane day-to-day -day reality, I'm into the idea that creating anything for us or for you must be done by us or by you. And the reason I'm into that idea, frankly, is... I'm just sick of participating in the the engineered spectacle, and I'm growing so fucking tired of interacting with people who continue to get caught up in that engineered spectacle. It's not a healthy way to live. It drains so much good energy from you, and it sucks the joy out of this experience. And it is designed to do just that. So the next time you curse me under your breath or on social media because I I did an episode on a podcast called Occulture that questioned things or people having to do with occultism. Well, turn this off and move on, because this is definitely not for you. Anyway, in the Patreon extension, Jason and I chatted about ritual sexual abuse and pedophilia, the sexual revolution of the 1960s, and possible associated social engineering programs in the Fabian role in the mental health development of children. A shout out to new patrons, David, Anthony, Cheryl, Daniel, Jean-Francois, and Primislaw, thank you so much for hopping on board the esoteric endeavor, and you can join them if you like at patreon.com slash occulture for levels of support. Hey, also, I was recently on my friend Niles Heckman's podcast called An Infinite Path. I posted that in both the free feed and on Patreon, so check that out if you like, or click on over to Niles' feed and give him the download instead. Although if you do, you'll miss my disclaimer about the cocktail flu I was suffering from when we recorded that episode. Needless to say, I was not fully aware of my conversational surroundings at times during the chat. Still a good one though, I think. And hey, we made it to the end of yet another installment of the self-grappling show. You know, I really like that term, self-grappling. I know I used it in the intro too, but that one may stick. Anyway, per usual, I gotta get before I get got. So until next time... You've just been initiated into a culture. I am Ryan Peverly, reminding you to love yourself, think for yourself, and question authority. Oh.